That's so fun because you clap now, but just think, you're going to be so sick of me in about three or four months that <laughs> you'll be like, oh, who's Dan? Today's Dane. Oh, yeah, whatever. I can space out for an hour. See, they kept me around this long. Yeah, it's because I'm the only one that'll work for virtually no money. So, yeah. Uh, so, hang on. This is going to be like, today is going to be like, actually, all this week is going to be kind of trial and error as I like try to, I, I don't really know what this is going to look like. You know what I mean? Like me being here probably, I mean, Rick's got me teaching you guys, I think, five times this week. I was so kind of not ready for that. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be filling in when you need help at Anchor House. But typical Rick, he calls me about four days ago, five days. I was still on the mainland like a week ago. Yeah, so yeah, I got you set up. Are you good for five times next week? And I was like, <laughs> five times what? <laughs> it's like teaching the anchor house five times. I'm like, oh, uh, okay. But I mean, I was ready. I am ready. But I got so much I want to talk to you guys about, tell you guys about. And I'm, one thing, we got to put a clock in here eventually or I'll talk all day. But... Um, <laughs> Nate, make a note of that. There's, a, there's an outlet back there. You could just put a nail on the wall and put a clock up there just so I can keep track because I don't always wear my watch. But I want to tell you guys a couple of things. First of all, um, there's so much I'd love to tell you right now about, wow, you're at Bible college and how to make the most of it and my experience when I was at Bible school as well. But I think that would be a time for like a whole nother. <laughs> Colby, I like you put your name tag. That's good. <laughs> That's good. You would be Colby then, right? Yeah. Um, but I think maybe that would be a time for like a devotional time or something. You know, today we're going to try to eventually get to the book of Luke. Yeah. But uh, I did want to say a couple things because I want to tell you a little bit, just a fraction of my testimony as it pertains to the word of God. But I, um, I, I did want to tell you this uh, uh, leading worship today was Seth, right? Where's Seth? Yeah. It was super. Wait, did you lead worship? No, wait. Who led? No, wait, wait. Lucas. Lucas. See, it's going to take. Where's Lucas? Seth is like, yo, yeah, I led worship from back there because I was providing the worship. Yeah, for all you guys. Wait, where's Lucas? Oh, he left. <laughs> he led worship. And, oh, he's an RA. Oh, lucky him. He doesn't have to sit through me. Okay. Um, but I thought it was really cool ra- and super random that he, um, he played that song. What was the for My Jesus, My Savior. Okay. Shout to the Lord. You know where I, I first heard that song ever? Are you ready for this? It was 26 years ago when I was at Cape and Ray Bible School. I'd got to do an outreach to a little Methodist church in a really small English village. And they played that song. And I was like, I think I like that song, man. That song. First time I ever heard that song. So I learned to play it while I was at Cape and Ray. I think I even led that song at Cape and Ray. And not to pat myself on the back, but I brought that song back here to Quiet Christian Fellowship, and we started playing it here when I got back from Bible school. And so I was kind of tripping out, like, here it is, my first day ever teaching at Anchor House, and wouldn't you know it of all songs. And I was super stoked because, you know when it says, um, forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand, that line? All I could think of was like, and here I am. I'm still, like, serving you, God, 26 years later. Now, if you think, yeah, big deal. Well, in 26 years, let's see how many of you are still vibrant, on fire for the Lord. And you'll appreciate what I'm telling you right now. 26 years ago, I was hoping I would still be a Christian, hoping I'd still be serving God in 26 years. But when I sang that line, what I thought about was not how great am I for still being here serving God 26 years later, but how gracious God is to keep me in his fold, to keep empowering me, to keep me in his service. I give glory to God for that, that I'm still here 26 years later, still on fire. Oh, I think I'm on fire. Anyway, still loving the Lord, still being utilized by God, I hope, and um, hopefully still be of some use to you guys while I'm here, which is what I was praying about this morning. Also, one last little factoid about me. Um, my son started Cape and Ray last week. So uh, I was talking to him. I, I know. No, that, yeah, it's, he's a good friend of math. Matt, Maddie's over here. But anyways, I thought that was pretty cool. My son's over there learning. To, he's in Bible, probably in lecture hall right now. It's probably uh, evening lecture right now. And here you guys are here. So I'm like super amped looking at how God's hand moves all over everything. Okay, so I want to open this morning by just telling you this. I've been a pastor for 25, 26 years now. I was actually ordained um, right out of when I finished Cape and Ray Bible School. Uh, I was asked to uh, lead a small church in South Africa where I actually 
trained under a senior pastor down there who was very influential in my life when I was still a young traveling surfer, but maybe that's a story for another time. And, uh, but that's why I was actually ordained. And here's what I wanted to tell you. In 25, 26 years of being a pastor, I, one of the main things I do around here at KCF is I take people out for coffee. And people constantly want to meet with me, and they want to talk about their lives. So their marriages, their relationship with their kids, or their relationship with their parents, or, I don't know, their life, and everything how's it going. In fact, there's a guy that's trying to track me down right now, trying to get a hold of me if my phone's buzzing while I'm talking to you. He's like, dude, we got to talk, right? Here's what I want to share with you right now regarding that. When I sit down over coffee and I start talking with people, I usually, like, hear their issue, and then I ask him a few questions. And I can tell really quickly, especially over 25 years of doing this, who knows their Bible? Who has foundation of the word in their life? And the interesting thing is when I start talking to these people about their issues in their life, it, the conversation has to go one of two ways. If I start talking to somebody who has a foundation of the word, in their heart, in their thinking, in their lives. It's a different conversation than your average Johnny who thinks he's a Christian but actually doesn't know anything. And the difference is those who know their word have such like a toolkit available to them to deal with the issues in their lives. They already have such a foundation that we can just talk about details. But with people who don't know anything, it's almost like, I don't even know where to start with you. <laughs> Does that make sense? Like, we have to go so far back. You have so far to go. Now, here's the interesting thing. A lot of these people I'm talking to, when I discover they don't know anything, I'm kind of embarrassed for them because they've, been, they've called themselves a Christian for 20, 30, 40 years. And they go to church on Sunday. They listen. They do the thing. They stand up. They sing. Maybe they put their money in. But they really don't know anything about God. And there's a couple of catchphrases that'll come out. I'll give you two of them right now. One of them is, well, I just heard this. It's so funny. Uh, right before I left on my recent vacation, I just heard this. There's a guy, he's probably 70 odd years old, considers himself a Christian. And we're talking about this relationship thing he's got going on. And he goes like this. He goes, well, God wants me to be happy, right? And I'm like, no, where'd you hear that? And then he couldn't answer. I go, because there's nowhere in the Bible that says God wants you to be happy. And he was like, he was kind of mad at me, a little pissed off. He's like, wait, what? <laughs> but that's a classic somebody who doesn't know anything about the word of the Lord. Well, God wants me to be happy, right? Uh, what's the other one? Oh, shoot, I should have written it down. There's uh, two things. God wants me to be happy. What's the other one? Um, eh, it'll come to me later. Anyways, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story, how the Bible plays into it, so you begin to know I'm trying to keep an eye on my time here. Okay, I got to what, 9.45? Yeah. Okay, I better speed up. Okay, so I was raised in Episcopalian, and in Episcopal church, um, it's very high church, you know what that means, you know, marching around with crosses, and I wore a robe, I was an acolyte or what have you, and it was really funny, when it came time for the priest or whatever to read out of the, um, out of the Bible, they had this massive Bible at the front of the church. It was like this big, like massive with its own stand. And one dude would walk over and he would sort of open to where they were going to read from. And then he would like back slowly away from, from the Bible. And then the guy that was going to read from the Bible would take a special, like, uh, it looked like a scarf, but like this kind of, you know, thing that he would put around him, right? And then he would raise his hands and he would approach the Bible like this. <laughs> And then he would read, from the Gospel of John. Now, you can imagine as a young kid what impression that made about the Bible on me. Like, wow, the Bible is like this giant sacred object. No wonder we never read it at my house, because <laughs> my dad clearly was not qualified to open such a sacred book, right? So um, then I, I get saved, and boy, that's another story for another time. But in a nutshell, I was 25 years old. I wasn't like having a rough time. Like, you know, some guys, you know, I had the heroin needle sticking out of my arm when I reached out. Jesus, save me. My, my, my testimony is 100% opposite. I was having the time of my life. I was surfing all around the world. I was spending winters surfing in Hawaii and summers surfing in South Africa, uh, traveling all over the world, having a ball. 
when out of the blue, for reasons I'll get to some other time, if ever I get to tell you my testimony, I cracked a Bible for the very first time because I was bored and looking for something to read. And I wondered why the crazy guy at football games waves the sign that says, anybody? John 3.16. And I read John 3.16, and next thing I know, I'm next to my bed crying, receiving Christ. But here's the thing. And um, did you guys all watch that the other night with Mark Wahlberg? Yeah. So, okay. Can you handle one swear word? Yeah. Okay. Because just so you know, I'm not a swearing guy. I'm not like one of those cool Christians that thinks it's cool to swear. I just don't. But I got to quote myself from 26, 20, actually 30 odd years ago, and I swore. So you do mind if I swear once? Okay. So what happened was, was this. I start reading the book of John, and I'm crying. I don't know what's going on. I'm home alone by myself. It's at night. And I'm freaking out because it felt like Jesus was in the room with me. He'd become like the most real thing I'd ever experienced in my life. And I finally go to sleep and I, I put my Bible on the floor and I go to sleep. So I wake up in the morning. And typical me, I'm, you know, I'm living in Eli Eli on the west side of the island. I wake up in the morning and the first thing I think of, does anybody want to guess? You don't know me that well. I wonder what the surf's doing. <laughs> That's the first thing I think every morning I wake up. I wonder what the waves are doing, right? So that's what I think, and so I immediately get out of bed to go, you know, start calling the wave reports, and I get up, and I look down, and I see my Bible, and I utter my first words as a Christian. Oh, shit. <laughs> Here's why. It's really important teaching. <laughs> I knew my life was going to change, and I wasn't having a bad time in life. I was having a great time in life, and I wasn't really sure I wanted my life to change. Because here's why. This is really important. What I realized in that moment is if it's true, like what's true? If it's true, if 2,000 years ago, God sent his actual son down here to earth, God, God, G-O-D, the one we all pray to, the one we talk about, blah, 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 God came to earth, that changes everything. Do you understand? Now that changes everything. That's like a full paradigm shift. And one of the first things that changes is, what did he say? Like if God, God who formed the universe, came to earth and he talked and people wrote down what he said. Well, I'm telling you, that changes everything and I need to find out what he said. So I start reading the word and I start reading books about Jesus. First, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I started as a lawyer because I was looking for loopholes. Do you know what that means? <laughs> I wanted a way out of it. <laughs> because I think Jesus was coming in. He wanted a monkey with my Say I was having a lot of fun traveling the world. You can come port. I was smoking weed every day. And hey, living my best life. You know, I would have made a great Instagram influencer <laughs> back in the day. Because I was really living quite the incredible world traveling surfer dude life, right? So I'm looking for loopholes, like how do I get out of this? Because clearly these Christian people I know, they take this stuff way too seriously, right? You know, it's an interesting thing. You can't really shape the Word of God to match your life, can you? <laughs> Start reading the Word of God, and it doesn't change. But what begins to change is you. Be transformed by what? Anybody? The renewing of your mind. Then you will know what God's perfect and pleasing will is. And what happened to me was the more I started reading the Bible, the more I had it, my paradigm of life didn't fit into the Bible. It had to change. And the Bible's paradigm of what reality is, what is true, what is right, what is good, has to become my reality. It was like it wouldn't, it wouldn't budge. The Word of God wouldn't budge. And so I finally reached a tipping point about a year or two into my walk. I mean, it wasn't right away. I'm a studious guy. I started investigating. And about a year or two into my life, I re uh, into my Christian life, I realized, okay, I give up. Your word is correct. Your word is truth. Your word is right. And even the parts that I don't understand, they're still true. And they're still right. And it's up to me to figure it out. So at eventually, at about age 30, 31, where's Hayden? There you are, Hayden, yeah. I was Hayden's age. I was like the old guy at Bible school, right? You know, I was. I was like the ancient guy at Bible school, just like Hayden. 
And that was the first time for me that I ever read the entire Bible, from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And if you've never done that this year, you're going to do that, because we're going to make sure you do that. It changed my life. All of a sudden, all these avenues about the Word of God opened up, and I realized that the Word of God is way deeper, it's more fascinating, And it's bigger and deeper than anything I could ever fully comprehend, which is great because what it means is I can spend the rest of my life studying God's word and I'll never get it all. I'll never understand it all. There'll always be new discoveries. You guys were up at camp. I found new stuff last week about the Garden of Gethsemane that I got to preach on Sunday morning. And I was like still finding out all this new stuff about things I thought I knew already. And I became virtually a Bible nerd. Do you know Ever listen to Tim Mackey or the Bible Project? He's called himself, and I love that because people sometimes say to me, "The Bible and God's Word," and I'm like, you know, man, if you're not excited about God's Word, you probably don't know it because it's amazing, it's mind blowing stuff. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're going to start studying today the book of Luke. We're not going to get very far into the book of Luke because I'm just going to give you some background on it. And listen, today you're not going to leave going, wow, that blew my mind. I'm so excited about the Bible. Thank God for Dane, who brought the Bible to me. Everybody I get it in this room is like coming from a different level of your understanding of the Bible. Some of you guys are Bible nerds already. You're going to be like, yeah, I knew all that already. Good for you. Others have kind of been faking it all along, kind of pretending you know a lot, but you're going to like find out new stuff. I teach really differently than some Bible teachers. I go verse by verse, and when I say verse by verse, sometimes we're going to go word by word. We're not going to breeze past anything. We're going to try to go in and find every last little detail that might be pertinent to our understanding, and we're going to pull it out and look at it. And I'm going to tell you, it takes time to saturate in the Word before it really starts to grow um, in your life. Uh, so my challenge to you right out the gate, before we even get into the is this year for you is the most phenomenal opportunity in, you'll ever have for the rest of your life to have the time and the freedom to saturate yourself in God's word and build a foundation built on his word that you'll ever have for the rest of your life. Um, before, you know, before I ever sent my kids to Cape and I wanted an experience, so I called every person I into Cape and Ray, and I asked them to think of everybody that they had gone to Cape and Ray with that they were still in contact with. And by the way, I knew about eight or nine people um, that had been to Cape and Ray over the years, including people that I went with. And I asked them the same question. I said, out of everybody you know from your time at Cape and Ray that you're still in contact with, how many have fallen away from the Lord and are out of fellowship? And out of all those people, which is a lot, I think eight or nine people and everybody they knew, you know, only one person had fallen away from the Lord. And as it turned out, that person had gone to Cape and Ray just, it was actually one of Rick's friends. And then he later on um, crashed a plane while he was smuggling weed and died. So anyways, <laughs> let that be a lesson to you. My point is this. If you build a foundation in the Word of God this year while you're here on Kauai, it's, it will root you for the rest of your lives. That makes sense? Okay, so introduction um, to the book of Luke. If you're ever hanging out in a bar and you want to win a bar bet with other Christians, who wrote most of the New Testament? Peter. <laughs> I heard Paul, I heard Peter. Big to differ. Luke. How's that Paul? Because Luke wrote Acts. So Paul wrote 13 letters, but Paul wrote... Th- Hundred and eight words, but it's just trivia. Now, by the way, you could possibly get away with the fact that it's likely that Peter dictated the book of Mark to Mark, and therefore you could attribute his words to Mark. But in anyways, did you know Luke wrote most of the New Testament? Most people know that. Now let's get some historical context. What are we doing on time? Thirty minutes. All right. Let's go way back, all the way to Adam and Eve in the garden. They get tossed out of the garden. Abraham comes along, and God makes a covenant with Abraham. We have the whole rest of the book of Genesis with uh, Joseph, and we have 
uh, Exodus, Moses, the captivity, the slavery, the, the getting released, the wandering for 40 years. Then we have the book of Joshua, the conquering of the um, promised land. Tonight on my Bible study, I'm going to start which is the story of the first leadership model they had for Israel. And then to all the kings, we big deal. And um, we finally, what ends up happening is, you know, they get, uh, well, the northern tribes disappear with Assyria, and then the southern tribes get taken away by Babylon for 70 years. They come back to Israel where they are for like another three or 400 years or something like that. Eventually Rome, by the way, when Israel comes back to Jerusalem, they're just kind of a sad sack nation. <laughs> they're always sort of being oppressed and dominated by somebody else. And then eventually about 60 years before Jesus shows up, the Romans come in and they take over. And for about 60 years, Israel's living under the oppression of Roman. And then lo and behold, Jesus shows up. Okay, now, what do they have at this point in terms of what they know? What do they have in word? Well, what they have at this point is the, they have Genesis through the history. Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. And the Song of Solomon. They have wisdoms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. They have all the major prophets, you know, Isaiah, Jeremy guys, uh, Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel guys, and they have the minor prophets, Amos and Micah. Something interesting. Before Christ shows up, they have 400 years of silence, right? Nothing. So for all these thousands of years, going all the way back from the time of Adam and Eve and Abraham guys, God's always been speaking to his people through Moses, through the prophets, through all these guys, God has been talking and they've been writing down what he said. But for 400 years, God's totally silent, right? And then Jesus shows up. And, you know, we're going to get to everything Jesus did over the whole next year as we go through the book of Luke together. But Jesus claims to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and blah, 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 blah. And for like 33 years, he lives on the planet. Three years, he has a full ministry where he's doing amazing teachings. He's healing people, casting out demons. He's doing miracles, feeding the 5,000. And then, as he predicted, he's murdered, buried. And three days later, he comes back, speaks for a little bit. What, 30 days or 40 days, I think it is. And then he's gone. Okay? Now what? Right? Are you with me? Historically, now what? Well, some smart people thought we ought to probably write down what he said and what he did. We've got four Gospels all together. It's likely Mark was the first one. It was probably actually dictated by Peter to Mark John. It's very fast moving. It gets going. Um, then we have the book of Matthew, which was written by a Jew for Jews specifically to explain to them that the Messiah has come and you better pay attention to it. 60 years goes by before John writes his letter, which makes John a fascinating book to get into for another time. It's interesting because the book of John isn't so much interested in everything exactly as it happened. The book of John is more like a theological explanation of Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's different. And isn't it interesting that it's 60 years later? John is like the last oldest surviving apostle. And he's got 60 years of ministry experience to write his book about what he thinks people need to know. But let's wind it back 60 years because now we come to Luke, who was written after the book. And Luke, if I was to describe what the book of Luke is, if we've got Matthew for Jews, Mark for the Romans, John, six years later, Luke is just the facts, man. Here's why. The author of the book of Luke is? You've seen if you're paying attention. Now, it's interesting. He's a Gentile. He's a Gentile Christian. He's a doctor. He was very likely a traveling companion of Paul. Paul mentions him three different times, um, including um, that Luke showed up in prison when Paul was in prison. Here's what's interesting. He's not an original disciple, and he's not an eyewitness of Christ. Does that make sense? He's not an apostle. 
He never had an experience himself with Christ when Christ was alive. He never saw Christ do anything. And here's a factoid for you. He is the author in the New Testament. Wait, is anybody in here Jewish? You are? Yeah. Messi- oh, Messianic Jew, right on. Because I was wondering, because that's important, because it's interesting that Luke is the only Gentile author of a book in the New Testament. Now, as a doctor, um, gives kind of special um, weight to some of his descriptions about miracles and things, because if there's one thing about Luke you need to know is, man, he is out to get the facts. He's actually a historian. Out of all the Gospels, he's clearly the most interested in getting dates correct, facts correct, and um, other than a couple details, he does. And what I mean to say is this, is they had historians around at the time that Luke was writing. And uh, Roman and Greek historians at the time, they had a way of writing, and Luke's Gospel echoes that style of writing. So he's writing as a contemporary historian, like, let's write this down for history. So it was probably written uh, about 60 A.D., so about 30 years after the death of Jesus and 30 years before John wrote his gospel. So get me? Jesus dies about 30 years later. um, uh, Luke writes his gospel, and 30 years after that, John writes his gospel. It was most likely written in Caesarea. That might not mean anything to you, but it's a little beach town uh, uh, just north of Tel Aviv coast, but also parts were probably written in Rome during the trial and imprisonment of Paul. Um, He probably spent a lot of time with, but it's also obvious that he had also hung out with Mark. I look at it when I've studied both these books, I spec and Peter dictating to Mark, they were trying to get down everything from Peter as quickly as they can to start getting the gospel out there. So in other words, they were like, People need to know about this. We need to write this down, and we need to send these letters out to everybody all over Asia and wherever the word spread. And I think Luke was like, wait, I want to get, like, Mark is kind of like the cliff notes. You guys know what cliff notes is? Do they still have cliff notes? Yeah, okay. Mark was kind of like the cliff notes of the gospel, but Luke was like, no, man, let's do the expanded version. I want to know everything. But you might find this interesting. 60% of the book of Mark is in the book of Luke, okay? So that clearly means that Luke was really paying attention to what was going on in the book of of Mark. Now, in addition to Mark and Paul, there's a lot of evidence that Luke spent a lot of face time with Philip, uh, with the apostle John, and um, the characteristics for the book of Luke goes like this. Uh, It's regarded more as a history book in line with how ancient histories were written, which I just told you already. The purpose of the book of Luke is an accurate account of the life of Christ, which would present him as Savior. Now, note that statement. Um, do you remember the name of that Josh Mag- book? Evidence that demands a verdict. In other words, information that demands you make a decision about it, that you act upon it. And that's kind of the way Luke brings the gospel. I'm going to tell you what happened, but what I'm going to tell you is this. Jesus is a real historical figure. He's a phenomenal teacher. He's a prophetic miracle worker. He's a divine being. He's the son of God, and he is the savior of the entire world. Now, that is key because Luke was part of the exploding church that was now going out to the Gentile church. And so he's writing this message. But he's writing this gospel for everybody on the planet. And by the way, if you don't think it's a big deal, you need to learn a little bit more about history. Before Christianity, there really was never anything quite like a universal religion that went spreading across all cultures. Usually how it worked was this. Your little tribe, right, had its weird religion. Whoop. <laughs> Where am I? Yeah, I might need that back, actually. Um, see, these are things I got to learn, huh? Like, I got to learn to, like, bring a clothespin. clothespin, right? Yeah, a little stuff I'll learn. All right, I'll do that. That'll keep it. Okay, are you with me on this? Your weird little tribe worships your weird little god, right? Then 
some other bigger tribe with a different weird god conquers you. Now you have to worship that weird god. Does that make sense? Yeah? And, but you've also become part of that nation. So if you are like a, let's just grab a weird one. Like if you're a Hittite and you get conquered by the Philistines, now you have to be a Philistine and you have to worship Baal or whatever. Does that make sense? Then Jesus comes along and he's like, no, man. I'm, I am God for everybody, not your weird little God and your weird little God. I am the God of gods. There is no other God besides me. And this bizarre thing starts to happen where the gospel goes country to country to country. And no, we don't have to conquer you to force you to believe in our little weird God. We're going to tell you about who God really is. And so all of a sudden, this faith spreads in different countries. And so all of a sudden, Rome is like, we're Rome and we serve and God said, what are you pesky Christians? Stop that, you pesky Christians. You're supposed to worship our gods and Christians. Only one God. And this starts to happen in Africa and in Egypt and all over the planet, right? And this is who Luke is writing to. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what your background of faith is. God is your God. And you need to know about the Savior. And his name is Jesus. All right? Does that make sense? Okay, so you're wondering. We're going to get to the book. Well, get used to it, because we're probably going to be in the book of Luke all year long. So turn to Luke chapter 1. We're just going to read the first four verses today. That's as far as we're going to get. How are we doing on time here? We have 9.25. Oh, good. We might, even, we might even end early. I wasn't expecting that. But you can always ask questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Luke introduces his book. Now, remember, in the book of Matthew, he's writing to who? Jews. So how does Matthew start his book? With a genealogy, right? Because Jews are all about who are you and who are your parents, right? By the way, did you know that's an often, a thing people often ask in Hawaii? Who's your father? You start acting up somewhere at the beach and someone's going to go, hey, who's your father? <laughs> right? Jews are the same way. Who are you? Who did you come from? Who are your people? So Matthew, writing to Jews, he's got to go, well, Jesus, and he starts all the way back at, like, Adam, and he shows the genealogy all the way through. Mark, of course, like, jumps right in it. So Jesus steps out and starts talking, right, you know? John, of course, he's the great theologian guy. John starts out with, in the beginning, there was the Word, right? And the Word was God, and the Word was with God, you know? He gets all, like, theological. But look what... Look. doctor writing a gospel for everybody on the planet, right? How is he going to open his historical account? So let's read the first four verses. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to, for, to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. Wow, look at all the stuff in there. I'm going to write the facts down. By, by the way, you notice he says these things handed down from those who were eyewitnesses. You can already tell he wasn't an eyewitness. Witness. Okay. So, by the way, these four verses in the Greek is just one Greek sentence. Okay. And the word fulfilled is really interesting, right? Um, he says, um, where, where is that word? Da, da, da. Oh, yeah. Right in the first sentence. The things that have been fulfilled among us. Good foreshadowing as a good historian would do. Because fulfilled what's been fulfilled we don't know if we don't know anything what's been fulfilled we don't know jack right now do we yeah he is going to show us that christ doesn't just pop up and appear out of a vacuum out of the middle of nowhere and say oh by the way i'm god right christ is like been written about since the time of Adam. He has fulfilled the entire Old Testament. He has fulfilled the entire law. But we don't know any of that yet, but Luke is already foreshadowing that that's what he's going to show. He's going to show that Jesus Christ is the answer to what has been God's plan since time began. Then he says it's been handed down, okay, things um, that 
at the time was an oral tradition. And he says also um, to the things that you have been taught. And he talks about eyewitnesses. So let me quote from Peter first quick. Peter says this. We did not follow clever, by the way, if you're writing this kind of stuff down, uh, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18, Peter says this, look, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Look what Peter says. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and we were with him on the sacred mountain. What mountain is he talking about? The Mount of Transfiguration. So remember when Jesus takes Peter, John, and James up John and James, up the mountain, and Jesus is revealed in all his glory, and a voice comes out of heaven, this is my son. He actually says to Peter, listen to him, right? Peter is saying, hey, man, we saw it. We were there. Now, what Luke is saying in the introduction of his gospel, isn't there. But these guys that were there told me what they saw. Down. Make sense? And then he says this, since I myself have carefully investigated. Now, look, Luke was probably the most educated of the four gospel writers. If you're taking notes, that might be something worth writing down. He was probably better educated than Matthew or John or Mark, right? And he says, I'm a Gentile scholar, okay? Um, Just saying. So um, he, what am I saying? Uh, Blah, blah, blah. Okay, oh, so this gives him real credibility. So if you're a Gentile reading this, you'll be reading it like this. It's like like Luke says, look, I'm a Gentile like you, and I'm checking out this newfound faith that is rooted in Judaism, but I'm not a Jew. Does that make sense? So that means we're going to cover all the bases, and he's going to give an orderly account. By the way, I just happened to look this up this morning because I noticed that. He says, I'm going to give you or whatever. And it's the same word um, that we use when Peter, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter it says, Peter says, I'm going to tell you the whole story from the beginning. And it's that same Greek word, cathexis. So what Luke, what Luke is saying is, I'm going to tell you the whole story from Dear Theophilus, now if you know any bit of Greek at all, you know that theo means what? God, like that's theology is the study of God, Theo. (laughs) If your name's Theodore, we call you Ted. It just means God, but whatever, yeah. And then um, Philo, most of you probably know, means love, right? So Theophilus, you dear lover of God. Okay, who is this Theophilus? Who is this lover of God that Luke is writing to? And just so you know, nobody really knows. There's a lot of speculation, and it might have been a Roman official. Some people think specifically it might have been this guy named Titus Flavius Sabinus. Some think he might have been referring to the um, high priest in Jerusalem. Um, There was a guy called Theophilus Ben Ananus uh, that they discovered um, through archaeology. It might have been him. Some people thought it might even be Paul's lawyer in Rome. So remember, when Luke is writing this, Paul is in prison in Rome, and he's hanging out with Paul, and he's also hanging out with Paul's lawyer. Isn't that interesting, these weird things that people find out? Yeah? However, most people seem to think it means to anybody who loves God. Anybody who loves God, this appeals to you. And he, um, um, okay, I'm just going to move on from that. And he says, I want to give you the certainty of the things you have already been taught. Okay, so he's writing to somebody specifically that seems to know a lot about Jesus. But what they've heard so far has probably been a lot of oral stories, a lot of um, stories about him, perhaps even by Paul himself. But Luke says, listen, I'm going to write it all down. I'm going to make an orderly account. 
And so, with just a few minutes left to go here, let me just wrap up today's teaching by saying this. If you are a Gentile, or even not, how awesome is this, yeah? If you love God, you're going to get to peer intently into a highly organized and investigative account of our Savior's life, right? What I've discovered in my life, whenever I dive deeper and deeper investigations into the Word of God, it's never caused me to come up with like deep questions about the faith. It has always created a bigger and deeper foundation of my faith, and that's what we're going to be doing here over the next six months or so. And this other main point I'd like to make you this morning is the gospel, the stories of Jesus, they stand up to rigorous investigation. Here's why I'm telling you that. When I first became a believer, when I first got saved, first had that experience with Jesus Christ in my room, I was super arrogant about it. I quite honestly thought Christians were slightly stupid. <laughs> Does that make sense? What, what do I mean by stupid? What I meant was kind of gullible. Like, oh yeah, there's all these stories about this guy and they believe this really old book and it, it's full of myths and fairy tales. I used to say the kind of stuff you might have heard your friends say if you have friends who aren't believers. Yeah, but the Bible has changed so much over the years. How can you really know what happened? It was written by a bunch of people way back then. And let's be honest, how do we think about people 2,000 years ago? We kind of tend to think about them as more stupid than us, right? Because we're, we have modern technology. We have modern science. We have so, we're basically smarter than them. And this idea carried over to me when I was a new believer. So I start investigating the word, right? And boy, was I pleasantly surprised. What I discovered was, oh no, there is like tons of historical evidence about everything that we're going to be learning from the book of Luke. In fact, the bulk of history ratifies everything it says Jesus does from all these different sources, right? Nobody of any real academic standing doubts that there was a historical figure named Jesus. Even people that don't like Christians that consider themselves atheists, they all understand that there is a historical Jesus. And so we have all these facts. And so here's what we're going to end up with today. Tomorrow, we're going to actually start with the Christmas story. Because, look, as most of you are probably from Christian homes, most of you, I imagine, anyways. You all are from Christian homes. This is amazing, okay? And all of us, even me, quasi-Christian home, being raised Episcopalian, we all know the Christmas story. And isn't it just this fun, little, warm, fuzzy story about a little pregnant, unmarried teenager? <laughs> Which, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be a fun, fuzzy story, <laughs> right? But, right? And, you know, and the star, and, you know, they got to go to Bethlehem, and blah, 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 blah. Okay, man, there's so much more going on than that, right? You realize that's just the little warm, fuzzy story that makes a good Christmas card. But we're going to go back and we're going to, like, you know, <laughs> operate on it. We're going to pull out the guts. We're going to, like, you know, open the hood of the engine, and we're going to get in there, and we're going to tear it apart, and we're going to see the precedent that got set up thousands and thousands of years, even before Christ, that was all leading right to that moment. And we're going to have Luke explain it to us exactly what went down step by step through the Christmas story. Okay? Well, shocking to me, I guess I did start early, because normally that would have taken me about 50 minutes. But instead, well, it did take about 50 minutes, but we got started. But I actually finished um, about eight minutes early. So does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you took your... Um, thing down. It's Colby, right? Yeah, okay. Wow, all right. Nice, nice memory work there. Yeah, Colby. Yeah. Uh, what translation did you read out of? Okay, so just so you know, uh, I'm reading out of the old NIV. It's a great question. By the way, which I don't think is a very good translation. <laughs> Isn't that funny that I would be using the old NIV and tell you that I don't think it's a very good translation? So why? Good question. Why? You didn't ask that. I'll ask it for myself, yeah? 
The reason why is because this is the first Bible I've ever had. It's about 32 years old. Um, my friend Creature, who it's another good story, who I met in a drug deal in 1987 and then was very influential in me coming to the Lord. That's a good story for another time, yeah? yeah. He told me one day, I'm, we're going to go up to Kapa'a and we're going to go, buy you a Bible. And I'm like, oh, okay, how much does it cost? He's like, dude, you got to get this one. It's leather bound, light, and it's 60 bucks. And I'm like, 60 bucks for a Bible? And I was like, oh, what a waste of money, right? <laughs> the reason I tell you that is now, oh man, do I love this Bible. 60 bucks, man, knowing what I know now how important this is going to become to my life, I would have dropped six grand. This Bible has changed my life, right? And here's the thing. Later on, it turns out there's better translations. Like when I went to Bible school, I used the NASB, the New American Standard. I also think the ESV and the New King James are really, really much, much better translations. <laughs> Oddly enough, I like the old NIV better than the new NIV. They changed the NIV. I kind of like the old one better, but for reasons I won't get into. But here's the thing. This has been my daily go-to Bible for 32 years, and I know it like the back of my hand. I've got it all covered up in, you know, I've got all my, all my, look, all my highlights, all my notes. When I say something like John 3.16, I picture, I know where it is in my Bible, that it's, you know, on the left-hand side of the page. I can find my way around my Bible, and when I read a new Bible, I feel like, Wait, where? I get totally lost. So just so you know, I'm teaching out of the old NIV, but I don't think it's a particularly good translation. I just use it because it's my old friend. Does that make sense? But when I study, uh, when I study, not only do I use um, more accurate translations, but even more than that, I get into the Greek, which is the best translation, uh, or, or Hebrew, best translation of all. Good question, though, Colby. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, your name? Kate? Yes. Kate, okay. It'll take me a long time, but I'll get it eventually. Okay, yes, Kate. What kind of doctor was he? What kind of, a medical, medical doctor, medical doctor. He wasn't, you know, as far as we know, a doctor of letters and, you know, so to speak, in science or whatever, but he obviously was an educated guy. By the way, I'd love to know what kind of medical treatments they were, <laughs> what was modern medicine in the time of Luke? I don't know if he was like, you know, I want to joke and say, waving dead chickens over people or, you know, well, let's take a pint of blood out of them like they did in the medieval ages. But those guys were pretty sharp. You know, they use like herbology and stuff like that, you know, treatments. Good question, though. Anybody else? Yes, your name? Nick. Nick. Would you say that you think Luke is the most accurate of the four Gospels? I don't know. Accurate's not, accurate's not a good term because if I say he's accurate, that implies others are inaccurate, which is a really good question. What I would say is I think his is the most thoroughly investigated, and he tries to include as much as he can that is, that is relevant. In other words, um, you take Mark, it, it goes really fast, you know, and he, he skips over a lot of details or whatever. And then the book of John, like for example, the book of John's really interesting. If you've ever tried to study the book of John and get it to fit into a chronology, it doesn't work. I don't know if you know this, it's kind of almost a little... Um, like, it kind of makes you go, I don't know if I like that. But the book of John doesn't, ha the things that happen in the book of John don't happen in the same order. Does that make sense? As some of the other, John kind of skips around and he tells stories about Jesus, right? And then he goes on and then he tells another story about Jesus. And you're like, hang on a second. In the other tellings, it went this story, this story, and this story. But in John, when you ever study the book of John, they're always like, okay, look, we're going back in time here because this actually happened a year before John's telling the story. Does that make sense? And so that's kind of what I mean. I think Luke, I think what Luke did, nobody else did. He went to multiple sources. Does that make sense? Like maybe four or five and, and specifically different apostles and said, tell me everything that happened as you remembered it. And that I think gives it a little bit more of like a historical document feel to it. But good question. But I'd hesitate to say more accurate, and if I said that, I apologize, uh, because I am a firm believer in the inerrancy of Scripture, that all Scripture is God-breathed and therefore is accurate, so to speak, to use your term. But just so you know, there are problems when you try to line up the four Gospels. Sometimes they don't seem to make sense historically, chronologically. But what I will tell you, 
one thing I've discovered in my life of studying the Bible is what I've discovered over time is when there was things I thought didn't make sense and then they were explained well to me and I discovered how they really were, what I discovered is there's a lot that's not known to us. And sometimes things that look like they're contradictions is just because we don't have all the information. Does that make sense? Um, I've got a, I can't think of it off the top of my head. I have a really good illustration of that from when you read what happens in, in the book of Kings and then it's repeated in the um, um, book of Chronicles. There was one time, I'll just, I got a minute, right? I got, I got two minutes. I'll be real quick. There was one time I was teaching through the book of Kings and some king does this thing and it's like the stupidest thing in the world. And it doesn't even seem logical. And I remember we were reading it I was with my Tuesday night Bible study, and we we're all scratching our heads going, it doesn't even seem like, why would a king do that thing? I can't remember what it is. That would seem so illogical and so stupid to the point where I'm not even sure that I believe anybody would do that, right? And then later on, I went home, and I was scratching my head, and read the Chronicles version of the story, and then explained what happened, that another country had attacked or something, and, done. and then all of a sudden you go, oh that makes sense why that king would do that dumb decision. What I learned out of that is we really don't know everything as it happened, all the context. Jesus shows up teaching. But we really don't know that person's backstory or what was going on in the village. I always have this one statement whenever I teach history. History is complicated, right? If in a thousand years from now you find out that the United States of America elected this guy named Donald Trump, and all you knew about him was he was a reality TV figure, it doesn't even make sense on your mind. But if you were around, and you were, you know the, the situation that happened that enabled him to come to power, which just so you know, historically, Donald Trump is a total anomaly, right? He's a guy that was never even a politician, for crying out loud. And he became the most powerful politician on the face of the earth. If you were reading that 2,000 years from now, you'd go like, what? No way. Leave that, right? But you were here. You saw it happen. History is complicated. And so I would say the same thing. The story of the four Gospels, even where they don't seem to match up perfectly, I don't have a big problem with it because my guess is there's just more going on than we even know about. That's what I found out over the years. Anybody else? I think we're out of time. Yes, Kate? I was going to ask, um, you talked about saturating yourself in the scriptures. Yes. How would you do that? Satur uh, first of all, read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, yeah? I also have a good recommendation for you. Um, and, you know, I know there's like, you know, read through the Bible in a year program where you take a little bit from here and a little bit from there. Man, if you've never done this in your life, start at Genesis chapter 1 and go all the way through Revelation, yeah? And I also have a fun tip for you that I, the last time I did my read through, which was earlier this year, I, um, I went to the Bible Project videos on YouTube. And before I would start a book, I would watch their Bible Project review of the book. And what it does is it kind of gives you a context for the whole book. And then you read through the book and then you watch the Bible Project video for the next book. Does that make sense? And you can work your way through. Otherwise, what I mean, Kate, is, you know, read your word every day. And always be reading the word. Go to Bible study. And when you watch somebody preach on a Sunday morning, this is the big mistake I made. I learned this at Cape and Ray. And I wasn't, um, you know, I wasn't as young as you guys. I was a 30-year-old college graduate. And when I got to Cape and Ray, what I'd realized, okay, I, when I got to Cape and Ray, I'd been a Christian about five or six years, right? And when I got to Cape and Ray, I realized that what I had been doing was every Sunday morning I was listening to somebody preach and believing everything they said without bouncing it off the Word of God and what I believe the Word of God teaches. That was the very, and I was kind of embarrassed to admit that to you, and I was embarrassed when I figured that out, that I need to know what the Word of God says, and I shouldn't ever let anybody teach me anything without me bouncing it off the word of God. Because there's a lot of people out there that don't really know their stuff. And there's different ways to view the Bible. And I, got in, I went down the bunny hole of all that stuff. And so I would encourage you that even when you're at Sunday service here and I'm preaching, well, you believe everything I teach, right? Just kidding. If I'm preaching from the word of God, you should be bouncing it off what you're seeing in the word of God. And if you've got an issue to teach, come up and let's talk about it. And
the very first, uh, second week of Cape and Ray. Guy raised his hand. Uh, there was 200 students. Guy teaches this thing out of the Bible. A guy named Dusty raises his hand and he says, you know, you can't teach that as fact. That's allegory. And he starts arguing with the guy teaching. And finally, the guy teaching says, look, what's your name, Dusty? Come talk to me. After class, I went running to the front of the class because this is like nuts. This guy just called out this professor <laughs> in front of 200 people. And everybody was like, shut up, right? But I'm like, this guy's got some cojones, yeah? So I go up there and I play. You know what cojones are, right? Yeah. You play basketball with a, yeah. Okay, so. I go up, and they have this discussion about allegory, right, and illustration and application versus what the scripture actually teaches. And at the next class, the professor got up and he said, hey, Dusty made a really good point. It's not scriptural. Isn't that interesting? So I made Dusty my best friend. <laughs> I did. I kind of forced myself on him. Because he's smart, and he's a critical thinker, and I need to start thinking critically, and I need to study the word and saturate in the word so I know what the word says. Because the world and other Christians, yeah, what is, uh, what is uh, in Ephesians, then we will no longer be as infants tossed by every wind and the waves of men and their teaching and their deceitful scheming. I got it wrong a little bit, but I'm pretty close. That's from Ephesians 4 right? Instead, we will grow up to be mature in him who is the head, and that is Christ. And I think we should on that moment right there, okay? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your awesome and life-changing word. And we invite you, God, to transform us through the renewing of our minds as we saturate ourselves in this book of Luke over the next six months, Lord. We invite you, God, to uh, shape us and mold us and build a foundation of faith within us, God, that is not based on the teachings of men, myself included, God, but is rooted in your and life-giving word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen? Amen.